Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Clear to hear. You don't hear God with your head. You hear him with your heart. He speaks to you, to your spirit. We're all wanting to hear God in our head, and we don't like, well, God, where are you? Pastor said that, you know, that uh, my sheep hear my voice. Well, I'm not hearing you. Well, if you're trying to hear from your head, you're not going to hear him. You need to hear him from your heart. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you that you want us to be clear to hear because you're always speaking. We love you and we glorify you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. You may be seated in the house of God. So, talking about being clear to hear, talking about discipleship and some of the fundamentals. Here's the first point that it takes an unique relationship. Being discipled, it takes a unique relationship. Things are just not just going to happen just because. It's going to take effort. It's going to take a unique, a unique relationship. Listen, a mentor is not your friend. We had a whole series on this a few years ago called Stop the Madness. It dealt with relationships. All relationships are not the same. It's not a broad brush. It's not a one-size-fits-all. There's different categories in relationships. And if you get the category wrong, you get the relationship wrong, and you don't get out of that relationship what you need to get out, or you don't give into that relationship what you need to give. And what happens is, is that there's lots of disappointment because there was unmet expectations, but expectations that never were categorized to begin with. You had an expectation on something in that relationship that it was never designed to give. And so a mentor is not your friend. See, we just, this, it's just this society, we all want to be friends. It's funny how, you know, you can be friends. I've, 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 I've seen it before. At a mall, there'd be two girls. would be like, girl, how you doing? I'm doing good. And then one of them would be like, what you doing wearing that outfit like that? Girl, you look like a clown. That ain't working. And the other one really is saved for it, and she likes it. And all of a sudden, listen, they'll turn on a dime. And all of a sudden, they'll just shoot their mouth one way, up and side down and sideways and everything else, blasting them. I want everybody to like me. Well, guess what? Not everybody's going to like you. No. And we want everybody to be our friend. But a mentor is not your friend. A friend will accept you and comfort you. And you're going to have lots of friends. Just know that your mentor is not going to be your friend. A friend will accept you and comfort you through your failures and through your weaknesses as a friend should, shoulder to cry on. But a mentor does not embrace your failures and weaknesses, nor do they coddle and cradle you through them. Their purpose is to annihilate them. Don't get a mentor mixed up with a friend. A mentor is to annihilate your weaknesses, not to accept them or cuddle and cradle with them. That's not the role. Throw 1 Corinthians 4.15 on the screen. As Paul put in 1 Corinthians by the Holy Ghost, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ... Yet have ye not many fathers. Paul's saying there's going to be a lot of people in your life. Y'all can talk about Jesus and do that. But, the, but a spiritual father, a mentor, a guide, an apostle in your life? Very few. In other words, he's already separated himself from a whole category of other relationships or people in their life. I'm your father in the faith. 
I'm not just an instructor. And that's a special category. And there's not many of them. Hallelujah. Y'all kind of looking at me like you've never heard this before. But that's good if you've not. Just chew on it. Chew on it. Be like a good old piece of beef jerky. Just keep chewing and just get all the nutrients out of it, all the flavor. Amen. A mentor is, listen, they're not a heartless human being. And if the relationship has been an ongoing one for many years, then yes, this, there will be an emotional reaction to failure. But once again, that's not their role. Don't put them in that category. Go have a good cry on your friends and your family's shoulders. And when you're ready to get back on your feet and try again, after a failure that you've had in life, then go seek out your mentor to get a better understanding on where you missed it. So you've got so many people, even in America, that they want their pastor to be their friend. And hallelujah for a friendly pastor. I hope I never come off as unfriendly. Amen. Amen. But they want their pastor to be their friend, but that's not, that's not that category. That's not the role. And they're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And people get offended and miffed because they want their pastor to be their friend. They're not supposed to be your friend. Go out and get hundreds of friends, but you ain't going to have just but a few pastors in your life. Yeah. He won't go out, eat lunch with me, hang out with me. Jesus. It's not your friend. And hallelujah if he has time or she has time to go do that. Amen. We need to build relationships. But if you want to just go and hang out somewhere, go get lots of friends. Have lots of friends to do that with. But don't start having one category and try to mesh it into another. See, once again, going back to what we talked about last week. See, haven't been taught that. And so you got a whole generation that thinks, well, a pastor is just supposed to be just, yeah, they're supposed to be my homeboy too, just like anybody else. Not even call them pastor or bishop. Just call them a regular old name. No honor, no. And you see that in society too. Having derogatory names for police officers instead of addressing them as officer or a judge, a judge, or a doctor as a doctor. Everything's just common. Not everything is not just common. Right. Amen. A mentor is one who observes you, and you have got to understand that a mentor is someone who is not living in your today. See, you're living in your today, but they're not living in your today. Their role is not to be living in your today, but they want to make sure you achieve your tomorrow. They're always pointing you to next. That's why I can't coddle and cradle you through your failures and your weaknesses. I'm there to annihilate them so you can get there. Wherever your there is, where God's got your there. Somebody to help you get there. Then you can have a bazillion friends that will hold your hand along the way. But you'll never get there unless you have a tour guide. That, amen help instruct you and give you direction and correction. Look out for pitfalls. Advice. Amen. They're there for your tomorrow and they live in your tomorrow. That's why a true mentor sometimes if you're, if you're listen, if you're really wanting pity, you don't go to your mentor just to get some pity out of it because they're not looking at your now. They're looking at your tomorrow. I just want you to have lots of empathy and sympathy. Well, I, I, I hate that you are going through that. I'm not like a fan. <laughs> but do you want to lay here? Then stay here. See, that's what, that's, that's what a true mentor is going to be. If you just want to lay here and just swallow around in this, then go ahead. I got other things to do. Whenever you want to go move forward and go into your tomorrow, let me know because I'm going to speak to your tomorrow. 
Hallelujah. Not understanding the category of a relationship, listen, will undermine it. Not understanding the category of the relationship will undermine it. In other words, if you don't understand it and put it in the right place, you'll never get out of it what God intended you to get out of it. Same with the scripture that it says that if you honor a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. If you treat a prophet just like a common old Joe, just whatever, then that's what you're going to get, just a common old whatever. But a person that will honor a prophet, they will get that prophet's reward. In other words, the Holy Spirit will open up things to, to, to the prophet for you. <laughs> They can give you a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom that you've been praying about for months. But because you just treat them like just so-so, just whatever, they title, I don't know them. They put, put my pants on one leg at a time just like they do. Then you'll never get out of that what God intended you. Amen. Also, I think I said that well enough. Let me move on to the next point. Amen. It also, it takes a change in your philosophies. Hmm. It's okay to ask questions through your apprenticeship. And see, that's another word that's hardly ever used anymore, isn't it? I mean, I almost have to go back to movies to medieval times when literally somebody had an apprentice. We don't do that very much anymore. We've lost something along the way. You're not going to learn everything by YouTubing. We've lost that apprenticeship of bringing somebody that's gifted and skilled as you are and bringing them up under your wings. And it's a combination. We don't have people opening up their wings no more. Listen, and we have a whole generation that don't want to come up under nothing either. But it's okay to ask questions through your apprenticeship, but not to be questioning through your apprenticeship. See, Mary asked questions. Gabriel was cool with that. Zachariah, John the Baptist's dad, started questioning. That didn't work out so good for him. If you're in question about every subject matter being discussed then there is no need in continuing the relationship. Say that again. If you're in question about every little thing that's been discussed, it's just all brand new, it's just, you're just questioning the, 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 just to the max, you know, there's just no need in continuing that relationship. And an experienced mentor will usually part ways with the one who refuses to change. Help those who need help. Heal those who need healing. But separate from those who refuse to change. That'll save you heartache in life. Believe me. Because the part of you is like, well, if I just separate, then, you know, my conscience will bother me. Maybe I could have done something. That ain't nothing compared to you staying in that drama, mama. Trying to change somebody that even God Almighty's like, I can't do nothing with them until they decide to change. And so you think you're going to do better than God Almighty? And you're taking the, listen, you're taking their life as your responsibility? Oh my, I'd much better deal with my conscience pricking me just a little bit here and there than to go through life and listen. It's like, they don't have no problems. You know why? Because you won't let them have any problems. You've took all the problems. How's it working for you? How much peace have you got at night? We're not talking about helping somebody out and giving them a helping hand. Ain't nobody, if you're thinking that, then you're hearing it all wrong. You need to be clear to hear. But if they refuse to change, you're going to have to separate. Because a person's stubborn, rigid, and unyielding mindset will nullify the relationship. Talking about a mentor and a mentee. 
And any attempt in continuing that particular relationship will result in wasted time, wasted money, wasted energy, wasted advice, and wasted planning. Wasted. Man, I remember when I first got into the ministry, I just want to help anybody and everybody. And it's not that I don't want to now. I've just kind of gotten a little more clarity. As we said on the front end of the message with Moses and Joshua, you can, you can hear a little bit more clear about stuff. I remember me and a friend, when we moved down to Mobile, there was a guy that come into a worship service that we were having at night. He just come off the street and, and <clears throat> gave us the story. Everybody's got the story. Oh, Pastor, I just don't know what I'm going to do. This happened and then that happened and they did this and then I lost that and I tried this and then I got stabbed in the back on that and I just don't know where I'm going. I don't know what to do. We bought it hook, line, and sinker. We both of us just went out and we took him to Walmart and, man, we got him all kinds of clothes. and I mean, we spent some money on this joker and we never saw him ever again, never Never. Again. Ever. That day you could have just put a great big round package on top of my head that said sucker. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you don't want your life to change, I can't, I, I can't, I'm not your source and I can't fix you. If you don't want to change and do something about it, why should I give a rip? Amen. You can only mentor them as much as they will let you. This goes with parenting too, and parents in the house. You can only parent them as much as they will let you. Now, when they're still under your roof, that's a whole different story right there. You can kind of, you can, you got some leverage right there, and you need to utilize every bit of it for their benefit. Not just so you can be like some kind of tyrant and dictator, but for their own benefit. You do need to exercise. Once again, you're their, hey, I'm going to go meddle again. You're their parent, not their best friend. God gave them to you to train up the child in the way they should go. Not go out shopping and looking cute together and color, color coordinating and have the same kind of outfits and just be like two peas in a pod. Well, hallelujah, if you have that relationship with your child. There's nothing wrong with that in of itself as long as they know you're the parent. Because it's cute when they're 7 and 8. It's not so cute when that difference of opinion hits about 16 or 17. And you let it go on for a long time, and now it's biting you. I threw that one in there free of charge. You can only mentor somebody as much as they'll let you. I can think of somebody here recently that really just opened up. This, this was last year that had a series of problems in their life. And you know what? Their childhood was a mess and it was a wreck. And the reason they were jacked up is because they've just had a jacked up life. They owned it and they wanted to do something about it. So we met with them and we started, to, we had a counseling session. And I was really encouraged about that because we didn't have to pry nothing out of that person they pretty much opened up and was real about it in other words they wasn't in denial they wasn't trying to hide nothing not making it out like it ain't so bad and we're like you know what I'm a, I'm a, I looked at Pastor Kimberly and my, I'm feeling pretty good about this I think they really want to make a change let's really try to invest in this person and let's just try really to help them so we set up a time and a schedule to meet again and haven't seen them since at all. Thinking just how much help they could have received from God. And how they could have in inherited a whole family of believers. Amen. And also, another point, it takes time. Yeah. Oh, time. T-I-M-E, that four-letter word. Time. Just like that four-letter word work, right? W-O-R-K. Amen. Although Hollywood turns a novice fighter into a combat-ready pro 
in just a matter of a few weeks. Y'all ever saw those movies? I can barely swing a punch. Two weeks later, they just like whooping up on everybody. And that might be good for a movie, but that's not how it works in life. Why do you, why do you think we got this shake and bake, microwave, just snap, crackle, pop kind of generation that if it don't happen in a few weeks, they, they're just they're done with it? Well, the, all culture is just that way. I mean, look at even, I've said it before, I mean, even look at society, what, I mean, all the TV commercials. Every so many seconds, there's a new scene. Movies, the same way, you've got to have a different scene. You're TikToking. There's got to be something different. That only last, you know, for so long. And then, I, then I'll go to the next one. Then there's another one, and then there's another one. YouTube, same deal. Just, I can just keep going. Eventually, they discover what they call algorithms, so they kind of figure out what you like. You just sit there all day, never watch the same thing twice. Just bombarded. Boom, 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 boom. And so the whole society is telling you, just quick, 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 snap, 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 snap. And then you go into a classroom to sit down, and the teacher tells you to be still and focus and pay attention. <laughs> They're not used to that. They're used to, like, if that teacher said something for 10 seconds, and another teacher come in and said something for about 30 seconds, and another teacher come in. See, that's how they're getting geared. Oh, let's switch classrooms too. Let's get up and go to another classroom and then another teacher. Then get up and go to the classroom and another teacher. See? And since you can't focus, we're just going to go ahead and give you medication. But yet society has trained you that this is, this is how you're supposed to be. Every so often you just have to you just look and then look and then look and then something new and then new information, new information, new information here. Touch there, this green, that's green. We've got to be fast, 5G, da 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 and then God comes in and said, things are going to take time. And I need you to sit, listen, and focus. And then they're just like gone. Because they've been trained and conditioned by society. Yes. That was real good information right there, y'all. And one of the hardest people to minister to is someone who comes from a long biblical background <laughs> where there was a lot of hearing, a lot of reading, but not a lot of doing. In other words, they have all kinds of theoretical information, but they have no empirical information. In other words, you could be talking to somebody about something and they can join right on in and quote five scriptures about that situation. And at first, when I was young, I, I was impressed by that. I was like, well, well okay. All right, word of God on that situation. Yeah. Until you got to know them and their life is an absolute wreck. Jesus. They had a lot of memorization, but not a lot of application. Yes. Yes. And you can start laying a foundation from day one with somebody who has just given their life to Christ and has only donned the doors of a church maybe once or twice. But once an adult who has been indoctrinated with religious ideology for the past 30 years is finally serious about the king and applying his kingdom to their life, it takes a, ter <laughs> it takes a tearing up of the old foundation before you can lay a new one. And that is hard to do. Jesus. I've been thinking about just even this past weekend. I've not taught on it, but there's many scriptures where it talks about, in First Peter it talks about uh, living a holy and godly life to increase your days. Uh, the Bible gives uh, the... the uh, 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 even in the Old Testament that it carries into the New Testament too, that if you honor thy father and mother, you'll have length of days. In other words, the Bible is very clear about things that you can do to shorten your life and things that you can do to lengthen your life. But yet even this week, a pastor's wife from a denominational church 
posted something that, 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 that I'm just paraphrasing, but it kind of went like this. Don't matter what you do or matter what you don't do, that when your time's up, God's just going to take you out and ain't nothing going to happen until then. And they have no clue. Listen, the pastor's wife that's supposed to be teaching this and don't have a clue. And unfortunately, I ain't going to give names or nothing, but they got a bigger mic than I do. And you're under that all your life? That's what you're going to believe. Things don't go right. Listen, you start reading the books of Acts and you're like, man, I want that. And God's like, I want it for you too. And then you look around like, hey, none of that going around here where I'm at ever, ever, ever. I'm going to go with that crazy place where they speak in tongues and stuff. I heard people get healed out there, get set free, delivered. I heard that there's manifestations, manifestations of the Holy Ghost just like the book of Acts. And then they see that, that it's real. It's not just a cultural thing. I know some places put on a show. I know it. Okay, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, though. Yeah. And they see the real thing, and they want that because the king's in the home, is, is in the house. I want that. And then you've got to go back, and you've got to tell them all that was not right. And they might not like that. It's going to take time to, to tear up that foundation. Before you can lay a new one. Matter of fact, there's some, I'm thinking the top of my head right now, they got indoctrinated with some cult stuff from like Jehovah Witnesses. They still ain't over it. Years and years of line upon line, good, solid biblical teaching where you got seven, eight, nine, ten scriptures that clearly uh, put things into context on a subject matter that you see from Genesis to Revelation and that, that we're rightly dividing the word and, and be under it for years and then be like, well... Now, the Jehovah Witnesses said, it's like, Pfft. help those who will be helped, heal those who will be healed, separate those that refuse to change. Because I'm a messenger of this word. I ain't got anything else. This is, this is it. Amen. It's hard to do that with people like that. That can quote scriptures on almost every subject matter in the Bible, but yet... Even their own self won't apply to their life. And when you start talking to them about that, oh, they get, they get miffed easily and quick, angry, upset, and offended. And you're only doing it because you, you don't want them to stay in that dysfunction. You want things to start eventually working out for them. They're, all, they're, they're always, you know them, you know them. Well, it might even be you. They're always in this cyclical behavior. It just seems like you're always going around the mountain. It's just like the same. It's maybe different day, different people, a little bit different situation, but it's basically the same kind of problems. It's just always going, well, you're the common denominator. How about a, using some, what about applying some of the Word of God? Listen, and doing introspection. Instead of having a quick verse for somebody else, how about you looking at you, doing self-examination? Amen? But see, you have to be humble to do that, and it takes time, right? Yeah. I don't see why pastor won't say, I know more he does. Your life's a wreck, man. Come on. Something ain't right. Something's not right. It takes a long time to reprogram your belief system, and many just don't make the effort and lose heart. I've heard it that way for 25 years. I don't know. I just can't get over it. I just, that's just what I choose to believe. But it's contrary to the word. Well, so you say. No, so the word says. Listen, so they'll hold on to an unbiblical belief system, but yet at the same time will get on their knees and ask God to help them. Basically, God, I want you to go outside of your word and your will and your way and just... Make me a special occasion to just bend the rules. Bend, bend your word for me. And he's not going to for any of us. No. It's not, and, and the people will want to shake their fist at God about that. Shake it at yourself. You won't conform to the word and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. It takes also, here we go, humility. That's another point. It takes humility. If I'm sitting around a table with my pastor and he starts sharing his heart on a specific subject matter, it's happened a few times, 
I approach my listening with the concept that I've never heard this subject matter taught before. By letting go of any arrogance, pride, or self-ego, I can then be discipled. You can sit in a room. I don't care if you've studied this subject for five years. Your spiritual authority starts talking about it. You listen like you've never heard it before. Don't start connecting dots in your head while he's speaking. Why? Because you're not listening. You're doing more thinking. And you're not, you're going to miss something. Oh, I know that. And you're not listening. So you can't, you can't listen. You can't be discipled. And if that continues, then once again, that person may be like, it's time for us to part ways. I can't help you. You seem to know more than me. So God bless you and good luck. And see you on the other side. Amen. By assuming we are familiar with the subject at hand, we often miss valuable nuggets being spoken due to our, well, I know this stuff mindset. I'm thinking of one right now that I don't know how many times I've heard that. This ain't my first rodeo. This ain't your first disaster in your life either. It's one thing to have heard it Study it and teach it, but it's a whole new level to live it and bear the fruit it should produce. I should have got an amen right there. You missed a good spot, y'all. It doesn't impress me if you can quote a verse, but it does if you can live it out and bear the fruit it produces. Like when I see somebody that comes into the fold and they finally understand God's not trying when it comes to finances. I'll just say that because that gets everybody's attention. And I'm trying to make a point, so I might as well make a point with something that will get your attention. And, and they finally understand that when it comes to finances, God's not trying to get from you. He's trying to give to you. There's an exchange, but God's exchange rate is really good. And to see them come in broke, busted, disgusting with nothing, work hard, there's that word again, work, work hard, manage their money, and give unto God what is His, hello, His, and then go over and above that and start sowing seeds, which is offerings. Tithing's not a seed. Go, go, go do to the, uh, uh, the, um, in God We Trust series that I did a few years ago, and that'll bear that out. Tithing is not a seed. You can't grow nothing from tithing. And you're giving back to God what is His. And now He ensures that there's protection on the seed that you're going to sow after that. Right. Amen. And so they finally understand. So they give their tithes, and they start giving their offerings. And God raises them up and builds them up. And then they get to give testimony to it. Amen. And then somebody else comes in. The floor. This is why testimonies are powerful. Then the preacher preaches on finances again and about the different kinds of giving. Because Listen, because every type of giving has different results. There's four types of giving. And each one will have a different result. You can't just, and honestly, just throw something in a bucket and expect something. Right. And that's taught. Listen, the first thing. When you have a message series that's taught, those that are absolutely in financial wreck, it's amazing that they never show up. And so then they come in, they hear about that. Ah, oh, I don't want to go out there. Then preacher trying to get your money. He's down in your pockets all the time. They all the same. And they think that, and then they look at the, the pastor because he's doing, you know, doing okay because God takes care of his own, y'all. And, and, and they're like, well, that, he might have his story, but he don't know my story. I'm different. See, they think I'm different, like, like the preacher didn't grow up in poverty or nothing. Well, the point I'm getting at, let me get off me for a second. The point I'm getting at is they walk in, and then this, that, that same person that did go to the classes on finances, that did study, that did apply it, and that now is doing pretty good, can look at them and say, 
I don't know what you're talking about, but let me tell you my story. I was worse off than you was. Well, let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you what I got a hold of. Let me tell you what he promised me and how he's good to his word. Amen? Amen. Amen. So it doesn't impress me if you can quote it, but can you get the fruit from it? Most of the arrogant, oh, I know that kind of attitudes are usually accompanied by a dysfunctional life with lots of drama around every turn. Just goes hand in hand. Another point, it takes submission. How much time do I have? Let's see if I can get this out in 10 minutes. It takes submission. Submission is not a four-letter word, but look at your neighbor and say, that's not a dirty word. Amen. Got a lot of scriptures here that I got to fl fly through. Amen. Not only do you have to choose to be mentored, you have to submit to it. Not only do you have to choose to be mentored, you have to submit to it. 1 Corinthians 4.16. So get ready back there at the sound booth. We're going to go through some of these. Amen. Wherefore, I beseech you, this is Paul, be ye followers of me. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. I think we're going to hit that one too. Be followers of me. You need to submit underneath this. Jesus up in heaven and the Holy Spirit's here inside all of us to teach all of us. But you need to come up under this and you need to use me as a pattern. This is why there's cults out there. People that go way too far and they pervert it. See, they leave Jesus and the Holy Spirit out of it. Amen. And they create their own new ideologies and philosophies. They get away from the word. But you're not changing 1 Corinthians 4.16. You don't have that authority, nor do you have the ability. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. Put 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 on there. It reads... Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So there's the balance in it. You got the book, you got the Holy Spirit. As long as you're seeing that in me just as clear as day, this is where you need to be and this is how you need to be following. You need to use my life as a blueprint. Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them. In other words, you need to pay attention. And you need to mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. If they they some elders in the church and it's a carbon copy of us, mark them. Take note of it. 1 Thessalonians 1.6 1 Thessalonians 1.6 and ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, you became followers of us and the Lord. Submission. Submission. You want maturity, you've got to have discipleship. In order to have discipleship, you've got to have submission. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also think we God about without ceasing because when you receive the word of God which ye heard of us, it is just going one ear and out the other. You paid attention and you submitted yourself under the word that was being taught. When you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. It ain't going to work in everybody. It works in the ones that believe, the one that received it as this is God's word. It come through that source, but it was his word. 
Amen? Second Thessalonians 3, 9. Not because we have not power, that word probably would be better by, by saying authority. It's the word exousia. It means authority. Not because we have not authority or power, but to make ourselves an example unto you that follow us. In other words, Paul did this in Corinthians too. He has the authority. Listen, the way it was back then, if the apostle come to town, you're to put him up, you're to feed him, and you're to take care of him as long as he stays there. And Paul come in and said, you know what? There's some instances where y'all are going to use anything that you can against me and against the kingdom of God, and you're going to have all kinds of excuses, so I'm going to work labor with my hands just like y'all do. I'm going to make my own way while I'm here. So when I tell you, you you need to work with your hands and make your way, and you need to contribute to the kingdom, you can look at me as an example because I'm doing it too. Amen. That's why sometimes it's not good. Golly. Let me just say a real quick story. Yeah, quick, right? Yeah. When my pastor first got started and the church was meager and he didn't have a lot of people there and there was a lot of people that were just poor, okay? Let's just, let's just be honest with you. He needed a car. So he went to a car dealership and the car dealership guy knew of him, knew that he was a man of God and he was a preacher and, and was wanting to set him in something nice. But my pastor says, no, this is my budget. And he says, well, what if we can do better than your budget? He says, no, I got to stay with my budget. You don't understand, you know. And finally he understood that this guy wanted to do him a favor. So the guy was going to put him in the nice brand new car and set him up with the same payments as the not so nice car. And at first of all, you would think, yeah, boy, yeah, God, favor, yeah. And years later, the, the Lord commended him because he says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive this one. Yeah. Why? The Lord said, because if you would have rolled in, even though you had favor, even though it was the same price as the other one, if you'd have rolled up into that really nice vehicle around all them poor folks, you wouldn't have had a church left. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not because we have authority, but to make ourselves an example. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, 13. Looks like I'm going to go over my 10 minutes a little bit. Y'all aren't shocked, I know. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 through 13. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. Build each other up, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are, here we go, and are over you in the Lord. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. My Bible read that too over me in the Lord. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh-uh. Like we discussed in the kingdom man, the men's Bible study. Most men don't like to come to church because they don't like to get told what to do. They don't, get told, they don't like to get told what to do by their bosses. They don't like getting told what to do by their wives. They don't get to, certainly don't want to come to church and have anybody tell them what to do. But my Bible still reads and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Admonish you. So it's just not, all oh, you're the best thing since last bit. Oh, God will work it out, honey. It's somebody looking in your life and saying, you need to work on that. Let's talk about that. No, I want you to make me feel good and, and just cuddle and cradle me and make me feel better and encourage me. No, let's talk about this. <laughs> and believe me, you get this straightened out, you will feel better later. Amen. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. To esteem them very highly. That's why when I'm around my pastor, I call him pastor. I don't say, what's up, Ron? Now, if Hope wants to do that, she can. I mean, that's his wife, amen. But I'm not going to go up to my pastor and say, what's up, Ron? I've been working out this week too, man. Your delts, they looking sharp, man. You've been, look like some cantaloupes up there. No, that's my pastor. And until he ever gives me permission to call him common, he's pastor. 
Matter of fact, I don't want to just go too, too deep, but for some of us in the fellowship, we refer to his apostle because that's his anointing. He's apostle Ron. But because it's a weird thing for everybody, especially denominations, he doesn't tag himself with that. He just goes by pastor. Amen. Just like I have an apostolic anointing, but we just say pastors because it's just too much trouble. It's just too much of a mindset to overcome. We got things to do instead of squabbling about those kinds of things. Amen. So I'm not going to, I'm going to highly esteem him. And I'm going to refer to him as the Lord would have it. Hebrews 13, 7. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. Nobody tell me what to do. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. See, there's the balance act, not somebody who just sits on their high horse thinking they somebody and just put a title in front of their name. We're talking about, you know, back it up to the other scriptures too, rightly divide the word. Those that have the fruit of their, in their life, that you can tell, that's a man and woman of God. They love me. Listen, they, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you're not at perfection, you need correction. But you need that correction with affection. Remember them that have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. That means their conduct. Hebrews 13, 17. Don't suck all the air out of the room. Here we go again. Obey them <laughs> that have the rule over you and submit yourself. Here's the God side of it because the world would like to use that and pervert it because you've got a lot of people out there that they do. They just, it's just all wrong. They just want to boss somebody around. Listen, here's the balance. For they watch for your souls. Not your spirit, that's between you and God. But God has put them in your life to help watch over your souls, your mind, will, emotion, your memory. As they that must give an account. I don't see why Pastor going to say that to me because he's held accountable if he doesn't. That they may do it with joy. That means that I could do it with joy and not with grief. Unfortunately, I've done it with more grief than joy, but I'm still going to do it because I'm held accountable. For that is unprofitable for you. Does it say that's unprofitable for the mentor, from the pastor, from the leader that you're to submit to? It's not unprofitable for them. It's unprofitable for you. Why? Because you're not, you're not you're going to receive what you're supposed to have received, and you're going to do without why? Because you shut the door on that yourself. 1 Timothy 5.17. 1 Timothy 5.17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet as the music plays. So in order to be discipled, you've got to have a unique, it takes a unique relationship because your mentor is not your friend, even though they can be friendly and you can be on a friendly basis. That's not their role or their job. It also takes a change in your philosophies. You got to start thinking differently. There's no use in the continuing relationship and you're questioning every little thing. It takes time. You're not going to get this overnight, especially if you've been indoctrinated with other things your whole life and somebody can take you through the word. Listen, take you through the word. Not through the book of first opinions, not, the, not a denominational creed. I'm talking about can take you through the word of God. It might take time to undo those foundations so the Lord can relay a foundation. It takes humility. 
It takes saying, hey, you know, I don't know. Just like you would, when I'm around my spiritual authority, especially you know, I, I told you guys a few weeks ago, I run into some things I've never run into. and Did I handle it right? I called a few people and said, hey, this is what's up. This is what I did. Did I Listen, I gave them permission. Did I, did I do it correctly or did I, do I need correction? Please, you know, set me straight. I can't undo what I did, but it was one of those spur of the moment things that I didn't have 24 hours to pray about, you know. And it also takes submission. But there's guidelines in there. All that stuff that I read, there's guidelines in there. You can't somebody just come up and grab a mic, open the doors to a place and call themselves something and then start wanting to butt into your life. That's just nothing but flesh. Yuck. That ain't going to get you nowhere and it, God is not going to bless that at all. So can you be submissive? Can you have humility? Can you take time? Can you change your philosophies? And can you handle the category of the relationship the way it was intended to be? If so, you can be discipled. And if you can be discipled, you can mature. And if you can be mature, then you can start to hear clear. And you won't be asking, is that God, me, or the devil? Because you're like, I know that. I know what voice that is. Hallelujah. Clear to hear.